Well, welcome, you lovely people. Um, welcome to Ray of God. And I will do our opening intention for those of you who may not be familiar with Ray, but I believe all of you are, which is lovely. Ray of God seeks to share feminine spiritual wisdom to help realize God in all ways and to align with justice, truth and beauty. The energetic state of the feminine is our guiding principle and holds our intention. And we believe that all genders hold the feminine and masculine within themselves. And while we are women-led and women-centered, we welcome and encourage all genders to join us to help create safer, more inclusive spaces. So welcome to the first of our Ray Read sessions, a monthly book chat. I didn't make it a book club because I don't want to kind of pressure people to read with a deadline. Um, I struggle with that with my book clubs. So a book chat with a fabulous cohort of authors. And our book highlight this month is Dazzling Darkness, Gender, Sexuality, Illness and God by Rachel Mann. Dazzling Darkness is a true story about searching for one's authentic self in the company of the living God. Rachel Mann has died many deaths in the process, not the least of which was a change of sex, as well as coming to terms with chronic illness and disability, and also becoming a Christian minister. So I'm absolutely delighted to have Rachel join us. Um, most of you will have seen her at our three, our first uh, three Ray Fests. Um, those sessions are also available on our YouTube channel. I highly recommend that you check them out. And so I'm just going to invite Rachel. Hi, hello, hi, Sima. Can you see me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hello, great, great. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah, wonderful to be with you all. Um, uh, yes, I'm going to shut up, otherwise I'm going to witter on very nervously. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're here. You're here to to to, to witter on. Uh, that's what that's why I want you here. Um, I was saying to Rachel before we before we opened the room that really this is just uh, this is just me wanting to spend time with these amazing authors. And if people show up, then that's great. I wasn't expecting so many of you to show up. So that is also wonderful. <laughs> and if you have questions, please feel free to pop them in the chat. I'm going to try really hard not to dominate the conversation. But let's just, I'm going to fail because I can't say enough about this book. Um, I don't have it. I don't have tabs. I started off by putting tabs on the pages and then I realized I, I, it was just going to be full. It was going to be full of tabs. So I've just got kind of themes with pages on it. But maybe we could start off, um, Rachel, with just a kind of intro to the book. There are two editions. Uh, you mentioned a little bit about it before we, uh, before we opened the room. But yeah, just um, how it came into being. Yes, so it's, I say in both versions, both editions, that it, for me, it is the only book that I feel I've ever needed to write. Uh, to put it in context, I've I've now written 12 books and have contributed to nearly 20 others. But this is the one, this is the one which I, I guess from the depths of my being, I felt I needed to write because yes, it's autobiographical, but it's more than that. It's it's me wrestling with what I think are the, the deep waters of of self and identity and, and what I call the, the, the hidden God or the, or the dark God, the dark God who's not always appreciated, the one who we discover often, but not exclusively, in times of challenge. And so the original version came out in 2012. I was chewing over ways to write something for probably over a decade beforehand, couldn't quite find a way to do it. And then, and at this extraordinary moment, a burst of energy, I guess, in two months, I wrote the, the first edition and I found a way to do it, I think, simply by staying with the trouble, staying with the challenge and, and, being, and, and saying, gosh, I, I'm, I'm, I was having a pretty rough time at the time. My health was 
I have Crohn's disease and I was just a terrible mess at the time. But somehow writing helped me get through that. But also the, the suffering, the pain, the challenge gave me a language in which I realized that so often we, you know, we live in a society and certainly in my tradition, Christianity, we treat darkness as negative, as bad. It's coded as lesser. I mean, so much so that I think there's so much racism inscribed in, in the language of, of color. And yet discovering that actually the place of shadow of shade of darkness is, is the place where, God, as creator, as maker, as friend, as lover, is most alive. It's in that darkness of the womb. And as you will know, Simon, I, one of the things that I think shocked a lot of people 10 years ago is that I wrote a book which just uses female pronouns for God. And doesn't explain it at all. And I think some of my, my feminist friends, I mean, people who were, you know, these huge figures in feminist theology, Christian theology, said that it wasn't so much the content that grabbed them. It was the fact that unlike most people at the time, I didn't say, I know we all talk about God as he, but I'm going to talk about God as she. I just went for it because I was speaking out of a really deep place in my soul and my heart. I did notice that, definitely noticed that. And I don't know whether, so I read the first edition in 2020 and it, I had come across you and I read the book and I, we were planning the first Ray Fest and I said to Fatima, right, Rachel Mann is absolutely, we have to try and get her and she's in the country and she's just down the road, even though it's online. Um, and I read the first edition and well, I, I have less underline in the second edition than I do the first edition because it was just everything. The second time I was like, okay, I'm preparing for this and I'll try and be a bit more measured because <laughs> we can't talk about all of it, unfortunately, in the hour that we have. But in the second edition, there are some uh, references to God as he. And that kind of struck me because I thought, oh, I don't remember that in the first edition. So did you add, add a few? Because I, I felt there was a... There, were, there was a reason when sometimes you were referring to God as he, and then when you were referring yeah. to God as she, there was a, there was a distinction. I, I, did, I did do that in the first edition. I mean, the key moment, there is this moment um, at a point where I'm, I'm just trying to figure out who I was. So for those of you who don't know the story, I came to faith in my mid twenties. This was after I, I transitioned from male to female in my early twenties and then came to faith in my mid twenties. But I, I mean, I came to faith in this, gosh, in this quite explosive way. I mean, those people who know me will know I'm, you know, I'm, I am a drama queen and I ended up worshiping in really quite a conservative church charismatic evangelical church and at that the point where i sp start talking about god as he in the in the book there is this there's this sermon that happened which kind of broke me but also broke open something new in me because there i was i was thinking gosh here i am you know i'm a queer person i'm a trans person uh i've got a, you know a I really trying to figure out my sexuality. And there was this guy in the pulpit preaching against gay people. And I'm sat there in the congregation at that time, not out to people. And I was just starting to lose it. And yet I'm thinking, gosh, if I get up now, this is going to be so obvious. And in that scene, I'm, I'm talking about, you know, God is he, him, but it's it's a device that I use, Simon, to then get to the point where I can say, oh, and God isn't a he. You know, that God died for me. Now, the, th the fact is, is that, of course, I, I, I work in an institution as a priest where all day, every day, people are talking about God as father. 
and he him and i have to be able to live with that but i i think there's within me as well i just this profound sense that i mean increasingly pronouns don't work they're kind of conveniences they're sort of necessary but god isn't a man of course god isn't a woman god isn't non-binary uh but what is true for me is a very particular patriarchal version of God, which is that sort of powerful figure who's, you know, the, the powerful man. That God had to die for me in order to discover more of the living God. Oh. Beautiful. Sorry, I'm just, yeah, I'm just going to sit here and listen. But I should also ask questions too. But I. No, no, sorry. I, then I thought, oh gosh, have I said something terrible at that point? No, so no. Something... <laughs> I will try to lose myself, lose myself in you. Um, I, I love the way that you didn't give an explanation of, you know, I, I think that, that there's a, you, you give an understanding, but it's not like the thing that sometimes people have to do. And this is something that's happening you know, in Islam, you know, I don't, I can't speak for any of the tradition, this coming to terms with gender and how we view God. And for me, what, the reason your book struck me so deeply was because I was meeting this dark God and you articulate her in a way that made so much sense because this dark God, this womb of God, naturally then I think of the mother as the mother and the mother that isn't just nurturing but can also be quite terrifying and ask a lot of you also and so it's this kind of flipping of this very um naive and limited understanding of what is masculine and what is feminine and kind of you know going beyond that but also integrating the two also and as you say, God is God is beyond all of that. Um, we'll definitely come back to to the, the aspect of um, of gender and associating with God. But I wanted to start with so the way that we talk about God is about our voice, right? And one of the main themes that you talk about is voice, and of course, the theme of our last Ray Fest was her voice. Um, and I wanted to I'm going to try not to read too much because that's not what everyone's here for. But still. Um, you talk in um, the prologue about silence and breaking out of it, which you say has been a key trope of my life. And mm. just want to talk about, you know, the way that you link this. So I want to say on page 35, you say, it is evidence of Christ's identification with the silenced. This is a God who has not yet discovered his voice. Yeah. And then continuing on page 36, as Christ had to find his voice, so I am on a journey to find mine. And I'm not going to read out the whole page, <laughs> page 37, you say that, you know, I'm encouraged by the thought that silence and darkness are not in themselves the terrible things. And it brings me to this, this thought that, you know, silence and darkness are things that we're, we're coded to think are wrong you know and that's what we kind of avoid especially in a capitalist society where there is no silence um and really there is no darkness because there's always light there's always some kind of artificial light that's uh, impinging mm. on any type of space that we try to create but this connection that you make here and also to grace i want to kind of connect silence and grace because you talk about um on the same pages about Grace signified by the absurdity of God being born in an outhouse in Bethlehem among nobodies and the disreputable. Mm. Like I just think that's such a empowering way for folks to connect to a concept of the divine that hasn't been sanitized and idealized and, you know, pictorialized as, as something very mild and meek, whatever, you know, that means something to certain yes. people. And I just wanted to ask, you know, if you could say a bit more about this connection between silence and the darkness um, in, in the lived reality of God as Christ. Yeah, well, I, 
I think it's just worth acknowledging that, of course, we are all formed in the the dark warmth, that holy warmth of of the womb. The and there is a quietude there. I mean, it's not silent, but because of course, I mean, we know that a, a, a growing uh, child can can hear sounds and all of that. But clearly, as you as you indicate. We, we live in a society which I think is terrified of, of silence. And gosh, I don't mind saying, actually, as someone who lives on my own, that there's times when I can find silence oppressive. You know, that's why I put a podcast on. That's why I listen to the radio. I, you know, I love music. There's nothing wrong with sound per se, but there is this endless ambient hum and I think you're right to connect it to a kind of capitalist culture where um, there has always got to be something more. You know, if there's a void, it has to be filled. And I think there is a great fear of the dark, of silence, because they signal death, they signal absence, they signal something that just needs to be filled up with something. Yeah, here we have God, certainly in my, in my tradition, we say the son of God, God himself, the very presence of God, coming to dwell with us as one of us, but not as someone who's associated with a great palace and, and power and authority, but in a nowhere place amongst those who have nothing. I mean, they, sometimes the phrase is a savior without safety, who has no voice except to cry, I guess, and to cry out inarticulately without words, who has to be taught to speak, no doubt by his mother, Mary, who I think taught Jesus those beatitudes, you know, blessed are the poor, blessed are the meek, because they are those values, those statements which relate directly to Mary's Magnificat. You know, he shall cast down the mighty from their thrones. Mm. This extraordinary solidarity of this God shown in Jesus Christ, who is not there with a preferential option for the rich and the privileged and those who've already got a voice, but a preferential option for those who are born into the silence, the good silence of the night, of a Palestinian night, gosh, to over 2000 or so years ago. And for me, as someone who and you know, I need to acknowledge I do have a quite a powerful voice now. I think sometimes maybe too powerful a voice to and have too much authority. But I never want to lose sight of that sense of me growing up as someone who, yes, I made a lot of noise, I was a show off and all that sort of stuff, but could not speak the silence that was at the heart of me, the truth that was at the heart of me that who I presented myself to be or everyone thought I was, was not, it wasn't accurate. And I had this inner sense of myself as dissonant and gender dysphoric. And, and the sheer pit into which I think I had to go to get to the point where I just could acknowledge that truth. And even then still taking years to continue to find my voice as who, who I am and, and just having that sense that God too is one who has to walk that path of articulation, who is not given words from the outset, but finds out who he is. And I, I often wonder, and you know, these kind of speculations there, in one sense, they're not terribly helpful, but they are poetically interesting. What what must it have been like for Jesus, you know, the, the child, 
the human being to have this sense of his divine reality as well, this vocation to be the Christ. That must have been horrifying, I think. Um, now, that's probably heretical to say that, but I mean, there's no record of that in the in the Gospels, but but there's something, it's just that it shows how one can identify with with God in it, who shows a human face, but to draw strength when you feel under pressure yourself, as I often have, despite my brittle public self-confidence, feeling that great sense of, oh gosh, can I do this? Can I be me in this really prejudiced, bigoted world? And having that sense of God's solidarity with me in a context where so many would prefer me to be silenced. And so much so, Saima, I mean, just to say the health hole that is so much social media, you know, some of the things I've seen on there in recent years about trans people, I mean, it's, it, it's, it goes beyond hate and dislike to essentially wanting to wipe people like me out. I can't, I, how can anybody would want that for another human being? Sometimes wonder, you know, I think God made a mistake. I wonder that a lot sometimes. Again, in our tradition, it says that when God created the first human being, the angel said, are you sure about this? Because, you know, <laughs> it doesn't seem right. And God's like, well, you know, I know what you don't. And I'm like thinking, I think sometimes I've said to friends, like, I think the angels were right. Like, what are we? Yeah, so. Gosh, I didn't know that. I didn't know that's terrific. That's extraordinary. Well, you know, that's my interpretation of it. I'm sure you ask any, any of the Muslim people, like, that's not what it says. And I'm like, that's what I heard, that that's sometimes. I'm <laughs> then I'm like, you know, aware of the angels around me. And I'm just like, sorry, sorry for what's going on. You were right. But continuing with the voice, um, I, I highlighted this, well, I've highlighted a lot, but 90, page 98 to 99. So this, coming back to you, say that God is the one who both gives voice to the excluded, the broken and lost, but is also in that voice. And if I may be allowed, I do want to read this, this Please. I mean, passage because, yeah, I know. I'm going to limit how much I do, but I would like to read this. For God not only is not afraid to love the different, but may be discovered in the different. And if God was in me, a trans, lesbian, disabled, chronically ill person, then she too, metaphorically, was all of these things. In asserting this metaphorical reality, which has so often been lost and ignored, God is bound and freed and can set free. This queering of the image of God frightens so many, but God has always been bigger, freer, and more capable of embracing difference than our safe human categories usually allow. If we are all bearers of the image of God, then we make fools of ourselves when we try to make that image overly determined and safe. It is a human instinct and thus understandable but when we let that instinct lead, we betray the possibilities of God, which dwell within each of us. And I hadn't planned it this way, but that's basically the answer. That's basically what God would have said to the angels. Like, don't be so limited. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't be so limited. It will, it will, it will work out. Um, but I love this, what you say, this, this queering of the image of God. And this idea of even the word queering, how much bigger it has become. And I know some friends that have started referring to God as, as non-binary, as they. And I always, I'm always find it hysterical, the reactions that people get to that, right? It, it's like, we're not quite over the she yet. So uh, do we dare even go to the they? <laughs> you know? But again, it's this... Um, constantly coming back to what is what is god and how do we not just relate to but uncover within and 
it's just language. It's just language. So I, I, no, I just say, and I think that we are, we, in saying that we end up in a place of, of decision really. I'm, I, I talk about it in this book and they are they're te technical terms. So if, if they're not familiar to, to those who are joining us, I mean, please don't, be alarmed, uh, you, but there are sort of classic, two classic approaches in Christian tradition to trying to speak of God. And one is the, the cataphatic and one is the apophatic. And essentially what it means is it's the positive way and the, the negative way. That's not a value judgment. The positive way, the cataphatic is all about adding words and names and, um, words and, and, and verbs and adjectives for God. And it's about expanding the range of possibilities. And um, I mean, this is where you'll correct me, Simon, but I, I remember reading that, that, that in Islam, there are 99 names for God. And- I had highlighted that, that paragraph, yes. <laughs> and and in, in that set, you know, in that set, what, what Islam is doing there is being cataphatic. It's, it's actually saying, we cannot limit God in language, so let's be expansive. Let's go for it. And and here's the thing in, in Christianity. I don't think we've been as brave as Islam. We tend to have a really quite restricted suite of words we use. I mean, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. You know, we, we have our classics. We, we might talk about, you know, God, my rock, drawing on the Old Testament. I, I often say when I'm involved in spiritual direction or teaching people to become spiritual directors is play, dare to play, acknowledge that the religion, which is the structural stuff, that stuff which often wants to put limits on it, may not authorize your words, but come up with what we might call an abc -dery of God, you know, these sort of, you know, how many words can we have beginning with A? How many can we have beginning with B? But that's one route. But the other route, which I think is equally important is this apophatic way, which is where we kind of want to let God be God and say, we cannot even begin to offer a name or even a gender, it's God's isness. Is extraordinary and i think this is one of the things i've learned most from from my jewish friends is it's the the unsayability of god was the unknowability of god and certainly from the christ the christian mystics take that route uh, this this idea that meister eckhart says you know to to use god is to kill him and often when we put a name on god we're going to end up using him, her, them. We say, we say God is father. We're probably one step removed from adding all sorts of qualities that mean that we can deploy God to, I don't know, exercise our authority over others. I think both routes have their, their way and value, but the key thing is, is to remember that God just blows our minds, shatters us. God is in her, his, their isness. <laughs> yeah, thank you for reminding me about the, the that section that you wrote about the divine names, because that's something that's very uh, alive for me. And there's also another um, tradition that says, and Daniel will correct me if I get this wrong, that God says, I'm in, I am in every conception you have of me. But I'm also, as soon as you have a conception of me, I am not that. So this, you know, <laughs> positive, yeah. negative, yeah. like this negating, as soon as you're able to grasp a concept, it's not that. 
And I completely agree that I think that having just one perspective, I mean, there's not just, and there aren't just two perspectives, right? There is, there are infinite number, but if we kind of look at two, that it's the integration of the two that I think leads to this deepening in God. And you know, this is something that I think that your book does. It's a, a journey of deepening in God. And that's mm. not an outer journey. It's not like I'm traveling as a body into God. For me, it was this kind of going within. Kind of oh, yes. In that, that dark God. Um, and so, but yeah, this, as soon as you have, I have an idea, then it, it's, oh, it's not that. Okay. <laughs> and do I, am I brave enough to keep going? You know, this comes back to the bravery that you, that you were talking to um, as well. I had, um, yeah, you say in, um, in Beautifully Grubby Bodies, you say, but it's never about playing it safe. And then you end the chapter. We are pushed further out of ourselves, going beyond what we imagine we could be, discovering more about who we truly are. Mm. I, you know, I'd also just say to listeners, that there's like, there are lines that you could just contemplate on <laughs> in, in this book. It's really, it's really very beautiful. And of course you are a poet as well. And as you were speaking about Christ, did he know? Did he know his divinity? Like, what did that feel like? Knowing his divinity, it reminded me of the interlude. Is it the first interlude where you have um, the woman who wants to be healed by him? Yes. And yes. You know, this story that you write from her perspective, and to me, so that that really made me think about that because in the end, when they have that moment of witnessing each other, it was she experienced how he felt to carry this divinity and mm. the incredible, I don't even want, know what word, a burden, but it's not a, a burden. Yeah. It's a burden. I think it's, it's a, it's a solidarity. I mean, I think it's, it's mutual recognition mm. and I, it's a mutual recognition of, of, of the unavoidability of, of being where we are in bodies and I, th I think that, that chapter on the beautifully grubby bodies I, what's really interesting for me is that the way we've been speaking so far that can feel i i think and perhaps for those who haven't read the book or don't don't know it um might think oh rachel and simon they're, they're talking about very pure spirit stuff you know it can feel like we're talking about sort of sp oh, spiritual stuff whereas I think at the very heart of the wrestling in this book is to say, I want to keep coming back again and again and again to the body and the way in which that's a place of knowing, it's a place of encounter, it's a place of dwelling with and going into God and yet being forced out of safety as well because i mean maybe i don't know maybe my experience has been unusual i mean in one sense i like to feel that my wrestlings with gender or with sexuality or with illness might be just extreme versions of what everyone deals with in terms of their identity but one of the things that is surely true I mean, tell me, you, you'll tell me, Simon, if I, I'm just, just generalizing here, but it's, surely there's something true about the way in which us living the facts and realities of our embodiment, it's constantly pushing us to embrace kind of fresh possibilities. I mean, I, I might have in my head some vision of what I was like when I was 28 and think, oh gosh, and I'm still the same person. But there's a dishonesty for me in that. There's a sort of, um, I, I'm not embracing my decay or my shattered body and, and, and listening to the truths of that. And what that's revealing about the divine. 
so I'm rambling here. I really am, Simon. Please no, help me. No, save no, me. not at all. I, I was going to say, I, I also don't know what it's like for others because, you know, I, I, for at least a decade now, um, I've been struggling with chronic ill health. And, and, and what I love that you say quite a few times is you're not shy about saying, you know, it's maybe a cliche that we find God in our suffering. We find God when we really need something to hold on to. Um, that's what it's been like for me, you know, and there's lots of um, reasons I could give, you know, kind of spiritual reasons, religious reasons to kind of justify. Um, but I like that you say, you know, let's just not even bother with that. Like you don't really kind of go into that. You're just sharing your experience. And, and so, yeah, I, for me, none of these concepts are high. They're very, <laughs> they're very low they're in my body. They're very grubby. They're, they're in the, in the mess, in the blood, in the pus, in, in the lack of ability to sometimes even, even move. Um, and again, this is the reason why to me, this is such a spiritual text because it is in the lived experience and one could say you know looking at my my background um how could i a british pakistani um you know cis woman how could i have related to your book but it's 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 not about these identities you're talking about spiritual truths and that's what i really connected to and you know and when we come to the body and the relationship with with god I'm going to read this bit from uh, Blasphemy's Prayer on page 131. For the God who comes to us in such broken places is anything but a crutch. We cannot use her. She comes in her own time and meets us when we have nothing else left. And all she is, is love. She is not comfort, but the thinnest thread holding you above despair. This is not a God we can summon up for ourselves and for our, our own purposes. And at the end of that paragraph, she is hidden from us until we are seemingly utterly broken. This is God in all her stark love, stripped of sentiment and our manipulations. The God who holds crucifixion and death in her depths. I mean, <sighs> oh, gosh. You know, stripped of sentiment and our manipulations. That's such a. Uh, I think that's where we're really asked to let go of all these yeah. all these concepts, and to yeah. really surrender. And it reminds me of um, you may have heard of uh, a Sufi saint called Rabia al Adawiya or Rabia of Basra, and there's a very famous um, saying of hers that people use a lot about. She was uh, found walking down the street with a bucket of water um, and a torch. And pe people asked her, what are you doing? And she said, I'm going to set fire to heaven and put out, put out the fires of hell with the water. Because people were stuck on these concepts that heaven is going to be this beautiful, you know, place that they're kind of getting enough points to get to. And then this fear of trying to avoid hell because of the fire. But God is in both and neither. And that is not what the journey, the goal is. It's living in each moment and surrendering in each moment. You know, it's funny, I, I've never said this before. Um, it's, it, and it's only because I've heard someone else read those words. Because I, you know, I usually, if I'm going to read, I read for, I'll read stuff myself and I might I have occasionally chosen that section what it's reminded me of I mean not, not least and I found that gosh I thought that's so moving I, but I think it, what it reminds me of is that so much of the time it's it's just not possible to live in that place that that level of sheer raw exposure to the love of the world. Maybe for a saint it is, I don't know. Maybe at the point of death, and, and that's what I think that's 
part of what I was thinking about there and, and trying to articulate because I, gosh, that year, that 2012, 2013 year, that was just horrible health wise. To be in that place of raw exposure is, and it's so difficult to say this, I know, is and can be a kind of gift. A gift in which you're sort of exposed to the facts of the world. But no one would want to go there. No one in their right mind would want to go there. And I'm sat here now from a place where, gosh, yes, I mean, I, I have really, really bad days and times when I, I'm just thinking I've, I'm spent here and all. I feel 20 years older than I actually am. But much of the time because my Crohn's disease is under better control and regulation. And because I, I live quite a narrow down life in terms of what I eat, just to make sure that I get through the day. I don't I live at that level of intensity. And, and I won't, don't want to live at that level of intensity, but I don't want to forget that level of intensity because those moments when we are pushed, not just to the edge of what we can stand, but almost where we think I'm, I'm over the side here and I'm hanging on by a thread. That, that is the place beyond the, the manipulation of God. And God is simply there in her, her rawness and exposure and and we uh, uh, what can we do except surrender i mean actually that isn't that ultimately the vocation i mean it's certainly the christian vocation to let go into god at all points i mean in islam i, I mean I, might you talk more of submission i don't know but surrender is i think you know, has similar, similar implications. I don't know, but it's that sense of God cannot be gainsaid when we meet her in her reality. And it is terrifying, but it's also beautiful and transformative. Yeah. I, you know, I think it's sometimes very difficult if people don't have something that they can compare to really understand that that those really dark moments I mean for me definitely with many years of hindsight you can I can look back and think well actually those were the, my most intense moments and the most horrifying and difficult and yet there there is such grace and beauty that has flowed since and and absolutely submission and surrender is, 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 I mean, I'm sure other people would say there's a difference, but to me, that's what I kind of, I kind of alternate when I think about that this is letting go. You also talk about violence in quite an interesting way. I'm also really conscious of the Yes, time. I mean, it's such a, that is such a risky, I mean, honestly, of all the <laughs> chapters, it's yeah. just the most, the riskiest, because I'm not really into violence, but you know, yeah. Well, I, I, I thought it was, um, I thought it was fascinating. I just wanted to say, um, we've just zoomed by and I haven't even got through a third of um, the quotation, the notes that I had made about, you know, references. Um, folks, if you have any questions, please do feel free to put them in chat. Um, if you would like to come on camera and, and ask something or share something, please put your hand up using the reactions button. Um, we'll touch briefly on, on the violence because it made me, it makes me think of perhaps this idea of surrender when you know when we think we have to surrender into something it sounds something that should be quite a peaceful thing from my experience surrender is incredibly violent when i've had to <laughs> when i've had to surrender or submit um it has been and this is why i really love the way that you you described it because i would never have have used that word to in connection with these moments of opening despite you know whichever container that we're held in there are moments of opening and again opening sounds very gentle you know you have an opening yes. but actually it's quite forceful it could be a rupture I mean, literally yeah. physically and you know 
uh, mentally, there is a rupture that occurs and there is a violence to it. And I, I'm very interested in that concept and perhaps we can find a way to, to create a space to, to explore that more because I think it's something that is in the shadows and I think a lot of people go through it, but maybe there isn't a space or a language that allows us to really, really process that this is what's happening. And this is still within, within you know, the, the love of God. But again, it comes back to acceptance, you know, which, which attributes are we comfortable with and which attributes are we kind of shying away from and thinking we're not quite, we're not ready to approach that or deal with it. So. I mean, I, I, I certainly think that the, the God revealed in the biblical text is not some milk stop meek and mild figure this is this is a god who who in making a call in our lives we can resist and run from but who is also demanding and challenging i i mean i i don't really talk about it so much in this book but in in another book um called love's mysteries i i talk about being born as grief um that when we're born we're born into grief and that there's a there's this sort of sense of um you know of just a reminder that childbirth is is layered right isn't it it's sort of it's been sentimentalized it's all soft focus and I mean, gosh, I don't watch Call the Midwife and people tell me it's terrific. But in my head, probably wrongly, I think Call the Midwife, the British TV show, it's all sort of lovely and everyone's having babies. But it, it's a gritty thing to be born and to give birth. And if God is like a midwife, if she is birthing things in us and if she is birthing us, and we are birthing things in ourselves and we are being called to birth things of ourselves. You know, and I speak as someone who, you know, I can't give birth in a biological sense, but feel that that's something which is part of all our identities. We need to recognize that this isn't just all soft focus and easy. There is a gritty... violent reality shock factor a grief a, a, a sense of losing in being born we're losing the warmth of the womb we're losing maybe that place of safety and that's that becoming ourselves becoming our true selves which is a vocation i think for us all it's not cozy and it's not comfortable and it involves wrestling and it, it involves the most extraordinary encounters with God. I mean, I'm thinking about Mary, blessed Virgin Mary. And I once, I, I once did a, a, a series of monologues, uh, that's in, a, in a, another book. It now says like, I'm just promoting some books, but in a different book. And I talk about how there's Mary sat in a kitchen and the angel walks in and she's got this knife in her hand because she's about oh. her kitchen work. And she's unsure whether to attack the angel or heed their words. And I think it's just that sense of just sheer intense encounter with change and shift, which, yes, maybe we want it to be nice and comfortable and safe, but is often of the most shattering and shocking kind. And I don't think we're comfortable about talking about that because so often we know violence is just simply vile. And I can't imagine that there is a single person certainly a single woman in this Zoom who has not experienced sexual harassment or for many of us, 
um, actual sexual assault or worse. We know that we are people who have a, an excessive experience of being done to and violated and having, and that's, so that's not good. But I think we can articulate a different sense of, of the shocking, visceral fact of when, when something new is happening, there is a kind of violence to that. And, and I use that word in that book in a, in a, deliberately to kind of shock us awake. But clearly, I, you know, I don't want to just, you know, be seen as somehow legitimizing violence because you know that's so often a power over thing rather than a power with thing i think it, i want that conversation so if anybody else wants to join me well and i was just thinking you know maybe we'll just have you back to discuss gospel of eve and maybe that would be a perfect <laughs> to continue this conversation about violence um we are, we are coming to, to the end, and I'm wondering if I should ask my final, but I want to honour the time um, that we put aside. So I won't go I think, into vocation. I think we have got a question, I think, possibly from the floor. We do. I can't see that. What's my... Has somebody sent it to you? It's, uh, uh, I th it's Shakira, whose hand was up. Ah, oh, I see. Go ahead, Shakira. I uh, just wanted to say that this heart is bursting from the seams in not being able to jump in constantly <laughs> with, with what you're saying and, and to be limited to a question. God forbid what this one has to say goes far beyond any question that this one could pose, but rather just... Oh my goodness gracious, so resonates so deeply with so much of what you're saying. And this heart has always said that the greatest gifts are embedded in life's most painful experiences. And, you know, we are, we are taught a greater openness to life and to death. And it ain't a pretty experience. <laughs> it, it is not a pretty experience. It is violent. And um, before you mentioned childbirth, that was bursting out of this heart, like, oh my goodness, you know, childbirth killed, you know, in this country, 25% of women before like the 1920s. You know, that's violent. Yeah. So just, just had to burst out. Thank you, Shakira. Thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you, Shakira. Thank you so much. Um, well, maybe that will. Um, I think we have to continue the conversation, Rachel. Just going to have to have you back. Um, and... Let's do it again. Yeah, let's do that. Let, let's do it again later later in the year, and maybe come back with coming in through a different prism, as it were, maybe through the Gospel of Eve, and but yeah. we'll look at some similar themes. I'm sure. Yeah. Well, I want to close with something a little bit lighter. Um, I just wanted to ask you a couple of quick fire questions um, that um, my, I think you've already, and also feel free to recommend your own as well. But first of all, what's your comfort viewing? Oh, gosh. Oh, you can't ask me this. <laughs> I mean, it's, I mean, the film that I think I've seen more than any other. <laughs> Is the sound of music, um, oh. which I know it's terrible. Don't uh, judge me, or don't no. judge me. But I it's, have a soft spot for it. <laughs> it's cheesy. It's ridiculous. I have a soft spot for nuns who wear makeup. The next time you watch it, the makeup, the makeup on the nuns is just completely over the top. It's wonderful. Um, but I had this secret thing. I mean, amongst I kept many secrets as a child from view, but one of them was actually wanting to be Julie Andrews um, in in The Sound of Music and wanting to be a singing nun. Um, but it, it, it makes my heart feel better. And curiously, 
for all of its technicolor shininess, it, it has one of the strongest anti-Nazi, anti-fascist messages in any film you're ever likely to see. It's, it's sort of wonderfully clear. So that's, that's, let's have that for my comfort viewing. Okay, I love it. I love it. Uh, and now I feel like I'm going to watch it again because it has been a while. <laughs> so thank you. And then final question. You overhear a question, a conversation at a cafe and you immediately want to join in. What is the topic? Oh, gosh. Oh, gosh. Oh, you can't ask me that. Um, <laughs> problem is I'm just permanently nosy. It goes with my profession. Um, well, here's the thing is that I know what the subject is, but I also wouldn't join in. And this is because I suddenly feel after all of the things I've said for, for those who are in the UK, this feels like suddenly the most stressful subject ever, but it's, I'm sat in a cafe and somebody starts up about how wonderful Brexit is. And at that point, I just want to leap in and tell them how terrible it is, but I won't because I just know that I'm not going to get out of that cafe for the rest of the day, am I? And, um, but seriously, Simon, I just, I'm so, I'm never getting over it. I'm just not getting over it. And I'm, I have no plans to. And I think it's a whole, sorry, I'm having a rant now. It's, it's not just about the idiocy of the economics, but it's the signal of a whole break with a richer, more inclusive, generous vision of human beings. I mean, imagine, you know, we're sat here now and we've got our current government trying to bring forward a bill of rights that they tell us will be better than the European Convention on Human Rights. And we just know that it won't be because of who's bringing it forward. And just to say, it's only since 2016 that I've experienced uh, a full-on uh, police-identified death threat against me. And I, like a lot of LGBT people, have just experienced such an uptick in hate and hate crime. And I'm not, it's not just Brexit, but it was like permission giving for people to be racist, homophobic, transphobic with impunity. Anyway, that's not a lighthearted way to end. Have you got another question that I can offer answer in a lighthearted way, please? <laughs> Go on, I'll give, I'll give you one more. Uh, wh what music are you listening to at the moment? Gosh, okay. Shall I just, let, the best thing for me to do is let me just see what I've got on play at, at the moment. Well, actually, so, maybe, maybe that, can, uh, that can take us out. And before you, before you press play, let me just say, thank you so much, Rachel, for joining us for the first Rare Leaves and all to you lovely people as well. We'll be back next month on Wednesday, February 22nd to discuss once in a lifetime with Dr. Amina Wadud. And that session will be at 1 p.m. UK time because um, Amna is in Indonesia. You can find more details about that on the website. And if you signed up to the newsletter, you'll receive a reminder for each monthly session along with access details. So with that, let's end with music. Okay, so here we go. I, hopefully this will come through and I'm gonna use my little speaker on my mic. So. I've loved the Netflix TV series Wednesday, about Wednesday Addict. If you haven't seen it, watch it. I mean, she is a, a god, a goddess. She's just amazing. And in, opening, in the opening episode, she gets her cello out and plays this version of Paint It Black, which hopefully will come through now. So 